normally, Aquavit and Ringo, I think this, both cuisines are very specific and they're very, uh, you know, true to their origin, but they're also based on fine dining experience. You know, when you talk about Swedish food, for example, uh, it's based on seafood, it's based on game, it's based on pickling and preserving. And there are a lot of uh, similarities, I think, to Swedish food and Japanese food in many ways. Also seafood based, uh, also a lot of pickling and preserving. And uh, so there are yet similar uh, styles, aesthetically, texturally, and so on. Um, the food that I'm embarking on now is a completely different uh, story for me. It's, more, it's a very personal story. And uh, it's also food that, as I'm learning about this, as I'm working with this, I'm learning myself. Uh, I don't come from a sort of an expert point of view. I'm just uh, coming from a, I want to learn about foods from Africa, from all over the continent, and highlight it, bring it to a showcase here in America or in Europe, because it's not talked about that much. The food that uh, the restaurants, the African restaurants that you see most of here in New York is either Moroccan restaurants or Ethiopian restaurants. And I think the Ethiopian restaurants, for example, is based on, you have a couple of things, and I've wrote it down. I think, I think uh, Christina is passing out, yes, we're passing out the, the information about the Ethio uh, Ethiopian and Pan-African cuisine. Ethiopian cuisine is based on the Berber spice mix. Berber is a, it's a sort of a mild chili powder that has a lot of, it's really Anaheim uh, chilies that are dried out, or Serrano, that are dried out, sun-dried, with uh, a little bit of dried garlic, dried ginger, and about 18 different ingredients into them. But this Berber is used almost the way we use salt and pepper in European cooking. Another thing that is always used in Ethiopian cooking is a spiced butter called kebe. And this kebe is a clarified butter, and it serves two purposes. Because it's clarified, obviously, it doesn't go bad. But the butter, when they clarify it, we also spice it with ginger, cardamom, almost like an Indian garam masala. And what that does is it's really flavor the food into there's no French or butter sauces or beurre blancs uh, in Ethiopia, but it really is a spicy butter that takes that, uh, it makes the food very rich. And this butter is something that uh, any Western chef or any European or American trained chef can use a lot um, when they cook a fish or you grill something, and it really changes the complexity of the dish. The other thing is what I have in front of me here, the staple of Ethiopian food, which is injera bread. Injera bread is made out of teff, and it's a sourdough pancake. And it really think it's, I really think it's the heart of Ethiopian cooking, because when you have it, if you've gone to Ethiopian restaurant, it forces you to eat together, right? You, you, you sort of take a piece, and you break it off, and then you dip it with the different stews. And it has a really nice, sour taste which we at Aquavit, for example, use a lot with smoked salmon and herring. And I do think there's a lot of other ways to use the injera bread than just for Ethiopian cooking. When I started to write this book, uh, The Soul of a New Cuisine, the whole focus of the food was supposed to be about Ethiopian food. But as I learned more about the continent, I really want to, I, I understood that while African cuisine is really unknown for a lot of people outside the continent. And it's also unknown for people within the continent. In Africa, very often, you know, in Ethiopia, you know about Ethiopian food, but you might not know about food from Ghana or food from Morocco. As we are in, in Europe and America, we always know about other cultures, whether it's if you're Italian, you know a little bit more about Spanish food. If you're French, you know a little bit more about Greek food and so on. And that interaction has never really happened uh, in Africa in the same way. And I think it's based on lack of tourism, that we don't go to each other's countries as tourists. And I'm sure there's a bigger explanation for it, but at what I've seen, there's really no interaction with each other's cuisines. One thing that I found out that through this journey was really like a lot of African food has been inspired by Malaysia, Indonesia, 
and India. And when you go to South Africa, if you go to Durban, or if you go to Cape Town, there's one cuisine that I think is incredible. It's called Cape Malay. And it's really, if you take uh, Indian food and don't make it so super spicy, but it's a beautiful flavored, um, very similar to Malaysian cooking or Indian cooking. And I think it's a cuisine in Africa that uh, we hear from um, the West, whether it's in Europe or America, would be a lot of interest to do. When I see a restaurant such as Spice Market, except for example, uh, I definitely see influences from the Cape Malayan cooking. As you go, like any, like any continent, food is being brought there by trading. Whether it was so in, so in Morocco, you have obviously in Morocco and Senegal, you have a lot of French influences. In Mozambique, you have a lot of Portuguese influences. Uh, so it's, it's just like in any other continent, it was really brought there through its trading. I think one thing that, that is, is known through, throughout Africa, we, we use a lot of chilies. But the chilies was really brought there. There were no chilies in Africa before the Portuguese brought them there. And so all of this has sort of been influenced by maybe for the last 150 to 200 years. Another reason why I wanted to do the book was also because most of the recipes and most of the people I met had extremely, they were just like all people, were extremely proud of their heritage in terms of food. But most recipes were oral. They were not written down. They were, you know, grandmothers that told their mother, that told their son or daughter how to cook it. But it was not like here, you can, if you want to learn about food from Provence, you can go to Barnes & Nobles, there are 500 titles about it. If you want to know about a specific region, even if you want to know about Japanese food, you can just go to the store, and there are specific books about this. And uh, when I went to the bookstore to look for regional African cooking, I maybe found two or three titles, and but it's not one book that really put sort of this pan-African experience together. Because I do think where, I said before, Africa got some influences through the trading, but it also gave a lot of influences through, you know, America, through Bra to Brazil, through the Caribbean, and obviously the southern states of America. So all in all, there's a billion people living in the continent with this food, but it's really affected of over a billion and a half people on how we eat today. And obviously, the rice culture in South Carolina is affected that way. The okra was brought this way. But there's a lot of other food that um, one think about, maybe not as African, but like lemongrass, sesame seeds, things like that, what I thought was completely Asian ingredients that I found had its origin in Africa as well. Even foie gras, uh, was the first people to do with foie gras was the Egyptians. So the recipe I'm doing today is really embarking on sort of a pan-African cuisine. And I'm using Ethiopian-based ideas with a little bit of Moroccan and then with okra from uh, West Africa. So I talked before about one of the key ingredients was the berbere. And I don't know if, if we can hold it up here. Or, well, berbere is, is this chili blend that I think is really the cornerstone. You have two types of main blends in Ethiopian cooking. One is berbere, and one is mitmita. The berbere. It's, it's milder, and the mitmita is very, very spicy. Very, very, so, for example, if you're going to make a tuna tatar, I would use the mitmita. So the food itself is, is pretty simplistic. I'm going to do a, a stir beef stir fry and just see if this great stove is working. We'll never know. It's always interesting when you do cooking demos. Um, can you show me how to turn it up? Great. So I'm starting with the onions. Just going to brown them a little bit. Going to add a little bit of garlic. As they're browning, browning I'm going to do my couscous salad. And this couscous. The simulina couscous, um, it's, it's amazing with couscous, for example, you, it's so common now, so you, you know, when you look at the package, you think it's almost came that way, but I've seen people create the couscous, the simulina dough, 
that the women are putting through a sieve straight into a boiling, really hot boiling pan, and these beautiful small semolina pearls are being created. And sometimes when food is, you think about, okay, how did somebody make this? But it's actually people that stand there and shake this out, almost like you would make German spätzle um, in Austria or in Germany. So the, the onions browning, I'm going to add on my beef. And also adding in chilies. And a lot of berbere. And the butter is used just as much as a flavor enhancer as anything else. So since we don't have another sauce, you're adding a, it's a lot of butter into this dish. Like I said before, because it really sets the tone of the whole dish. One thing you find, I found, especially by Ethiopian or other cuisines too, it's very well balanced. The binjera bread takes is sour. The beef dish here is, is pretty spicy. And then you have uh, cottage cheese very often, or in Indian food, it'd be raita, uh, that takes away the heat. So there's always something that makes the, uh, the dish very, very well balanced. If you would go to a restaurant today and order this dish, it would be called tibs. There are different types of tibs. There's lamb tibs. There's beef tips, and it's a pretty straightforward dish. We're going to add in a little bit of tomato. And tomato takes off. We're not going to cook them a lot. As you see, the beef is it's getting reddened now. I have my beef stir fry here. The next dish I'm going to do is to work with the okra. And the okra, we blanched the okra first. And I love okra. I think okra is it's so slimy and good. It's not for everyone. But I love it. I think it's really great. And we're going to add Peanuts, and peanuts is something that is used mostly in West Africa, in Senegal and in Ghana, use a lot of peanuts in the soups and so on. So here I'm really borrowing ingredients from all over the continent. And I find that by understanding and learning more about African cuisine, there's a lot of ingredients that we can use both in Aquavit's kitchen and in Ringo's kitchen. So I think just for, as a chef, being intrigued, I think that's one key thing with, as a chef, if you're always committed to learning new things, we learn a lot about Latin food, we learn a lot about Asian food, I think one thing that we're going to learn a lot about in the coming years is going to be African cuisine. And it really starts by, I think the chef has really a good, important influence there by inspiring people through cookbooks or through articles or through restaurants. Um, and obviously we need people to go there too and experience all this. And obviously in the continent one wouldn't mix this Senegalese or this Ghanaian inspired dish with the Ethiopian inspired uh, tibs and then the couscous that I'm going to put on here. But I think it's a fun way of creating and if, if there would be sort of a modern African restaurant today, I think this is a very, uh, it's a fun way of combining dishes and cultures just as you have sort of pan Mediterranean restaurant that does it or pan Asian restaurants. The couscous is cooked. I'm going to add in Mango, tomato, and raisins to give it a lot of different texture. 
It's nice cooking when you're rushed, because you just bum, 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 <laughs> just put it in. But really what I'm trying to get is a lot of different textures, a lot of different colors. But the mango's there for a reason besides color. It takes off heat on the very spicy uh, beef dish. So, and I think it's a dish that you can eat, can be eaten by itself. Just a couscous as such. Or it's a perfect complement to fish, chicken, or a beef dish. And you know, the food in Africa is, is, is completely changing. But I think one thing that South Africa and Morocco has done is really put Africa on the map in terms of beverages. And there is, as I started to do this, cooking journey, you know. I stayed with my dishwasher family in Senegal to learn about Senegalese food, and we stayed with cab drivers' families in South Africa to learn about real South African cooking. And a lot of people always told me, well, the one person that knows a lot about African food and African flavors and so on is Peter Morales. And Peter's, I've known Peter for about three, four years, and he's extremely passionate about the food and the continents as such, and he's the one that I think sells the most South African wines into this country. So Peter's going to come up and talk a little bit about how do you pair beverages with such a sort of spicy cuisine. How are you? Well, that's good. Good to see how you. How are you? Hello. Good morning, uh, quite a pleasure to be here. And uh, obviously, talking a little bit about Pan-African foods and uh, the continent of, of Africa. You know, uh, at my 20 years in this wine business, it's, it's been all over the world, but this is one of the most interesting regions of the world because of the spice. The ultimate spice is wine. It's liquid spice. And, and the integration and the bridging of, of what Chef has done here and many of you out in the audience have done, uh, I, I'm really a student of, of, of the vine, as well as the integration with food. But if you look in different regions of the world and see what noble varietals grow the best, what you find is that the uh, soil types make a big difference. And spices, it, it makes a difference where black pepper is from. The old spice trade around the Cape of Good Hope, for instance, the Dutch East India Trading Company, I mean, spices were traded for currency. So it was very interesting in, in, in earlier times that spices were that important coming around from India and the other regions going into Europe. But what you find in this area is that if, if you start in the North African area, for instance, uh, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and things like that, you have meads and, and uh, you, you know the term honeymoon. Uh, it was from one full moon to another, and it was honey wine being one of the most natural preservatives. But th that was traditional. When people went away on honeymoon, they drank honey wine every day with their various foods and ingredients from that area. And this transferred up into Europe over, over time. If you look in Morocco, uh, some of the noble varietals that were grown there. Of course, our palates have become so sophisticated in this day and time that uh, you know, we, we, we say, you know, we really like this from this area of France this area of Bordeaux, uh, Napa, Sonoma. But uh, the Cape of Good Hope and, and some of the foods that come out of that area, you have German influences, you have French influences, you have obviously uh, Cape Malay, as, as, as Chef has said, and then you have the indigenous African people there. So just like, I, I'm from the Caribbean originally, but my family is part French and part Spanish. So that's my winemaking side. The African side is my agricultural side. So in, in looking at this and pairing up uh, wines that take heat off of food. People think that sugar is the panacea, but remember what wine is. It's complex carbons, and, and when the body breaks a wine down, it's sugars, and some have more residual sugar than others. But when you're looking at foods like this, a simple red, you know, people like big, robust, full alcohol reds, but you really don't need a heavy red. You, you really need a red that's flavorful, you know, about 12, 13% alcohol, nice style, good fruit complement that will bridge with the spices. If it's heat, that's gonna take the heat off. Remember our mouths are 98.6 degrees. So some of these red wines, you know, you can cool down a little bit and, and still have a pleasurable experience because I think sometimes we serve the reds too warm. Last night we did, we matched up, uh, we did a wine dinner and we matched up cod and plum sauce. 
with a wine called Pinotage. Now, traditionally, people say codfish, oh, we got to find a good white wine for cod. No, we went with Pinotage, which is Pinot Noir, Cinso hybrid. And it worked beautifully, pulled up the plum sauce, didn't outrun the fish, the oils in the fish married well. So it's balanced and, and things like that that I, I think people on the African continent have come to know almost by trial and error. The other thing is when you're out in the bush and you're not in a room or in front of a table, what you have is your senses are un, unadulterated. So all of a sudden, you can really get down into the glass. And the olfactory, obviously, is the most powerful in, in you know, this rendition of, of wine and spice. Chef? Right. Well, so um, the dish here is, I mean, I think it's, this is as far as way as Ringo or Aqua with Cuisine, you know, it's, it's just really, a, it's really not restaurant food. It's really meant to be family uh, and shared, um, you know, with, with your friends. But how you would eat an Ethiopian restaurant, and for those of you who maybe haven't had the chance, would be, you know, it's essentially just you break off from the bread here, and then you maybe start with the meat, and then you use the couscous in this case, or the okra, and you just dip. And that's why you need that much butter in there, because since you don't have another sauce, in order to stop it from being really dry, and since we don't have any guinea pigs here, I'm going to eat it myself. Oh, chef, <laughs> I, I can't let you do that. You know, I'm a big okra fan, too. Good, good. But it's spicy, but it's not super, super hot. I think it's nice balance. And then adding in with the with wine. What wine would you serve with this? You know, Chef, I would do a Chenin Blanc with this. Yeah. A Chenin Blanc or a Chenin Chard blend. Because uh, the fruits that are coming up in this, Spices, it will bridge it, it won't overpower it, but it will really complement on the palate. And it's going to make you want to have some more food and have another glass of wine instead of, I'm only having one. So that's what you have to remember, too. Um, does anybody have any questions about African cuisine or African food? Um, that's good. Nobody has one question? Yes? What's the green herb that you were throwing in? Uh, it was parsley and cilantro. Add it in. You know, in the end. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> Who's got a question? Yes? Start to see with the lights. Hi, my name is Scott Barton. I'm here in New York City. How are you, Scott? Hi. Hi, um, Scott. Do you see a beginning in Africa of what you're trying to present here on the plate to us? Well, I, I think I really looked at myself, like, hey, if I'm not writing a book about this topic, I don't really think anyone is going to be able to write about it. So, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a plateau that a lot of people listen. And uh, you know, the, each book or each product you do is a different product. But I feel like I'm not an expert, and I'm very open about it. I'm not an expert about the whole conference as such. But if we bring highlight to it, we inspire people to talk about it, travel to there, go there, um, try the different foods, and also as us as chefs, you know, when somebody came with, when I started cooking, it was only French food. Italian food wasn't even, a, you know, yeah. considered fine dining. Then came the Asian wave, and that was always rebuffed. It was not good enough, but then eventually got accepted all over the world. Then came the Nuevo Latino food, same thing here. And now, 15, 20 years later, Pan-Asian or Nuevo Latino doesn't sound weird in a fine dining experience. So I do think, you have to open it up, introduce it to people. Uh, and I think as a chef that's been intrigued by different trends and foods, where it comes from, Africa makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think, I think also people try to find themselves. And, and part of it is this homecoming. There are over a half a million Americans touring that area of the world now, the land of diamonds and gold and all the other things. Mm -hmm. So it's fashionable. And as people climb the economic ladder, yeah. They, they want to reach out to the most exotic foods and wines and say, I had this and you didn't. Yeah. So I think that's part of it, and we have to deliver that. Yeah. Another question? Hi, I'm Michelle from uh, ICE, the Institute of Culinary Education. How does pastry fit into this? Um, chocolate grows all over Africa. Yeah. Is chocolate a staple it's ingredient it's very, in pastry? Very, pastry, I think it's interesting, because one common thing is really that the, all the endings are fruits. It's really fresh fruits and different types of fresh fruits. But pastry shops are very, very popular. And obviously, there are 
a lot of European or Indian influences in those shops. So all over Africa you have French desserts a lot. And then, you know, those French people have been there for generations, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But uh, I think pastries are definitely related more to uh, celebration of some sort. Um, and really, if you are in a, a restaurant where you want to show your cuisine, pastries comes in that way because you, uh, you, know, you want to show a certain standard of it. But true indigenous is, is mainly just uh, fruits. Yes? Marcus, yep. I'm from um, England, but I have a restaurant in the Caribbean, yep. uh, in the British Virgin Islands. One thing I've been slightly disturbed about in the British Virgin Islands is their sort of dependency on fried chicken yep. and um, Johnny cakes and sort of refined carbohydrates, which are all tasty and good, but um, you know, the, as, as a staple, mm -hmm. they can be a, a beaut. Will you... Were you, I don't know if you went to the Caribbean. I, yeah, I I've been get, many I, times. I did get your book yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I love Johnny cakes, by the way. Yeah, I no, love. They're Johnny. great. They're great. But sort of four or five mm -hmm. a day is a bit too much. Yeah. Um, my 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 point here was you were you disappointed with how it seemed to me that the local produce wasn't really being taken full advantage of. The British Virgin Islands is a good example. Majority of the food now is imported. But I think like any any place anything it's. Tourism drives a lot of that, right? And there's not the indigenous people of British Virgin that stays at your resort. It's Americans or, or Europeans. Mm -hmm. So tour, when you know tourism, sometimes we open to try. When we go to Tuscany, we open to try exactly what it is in Tuscany. And when we stay at the Ritz Carlton in the British Virgin Island, we want to have club sandwich. So it, it, and I think it takes a long time to change that mentality. You know. Um, and it, you know, you even look at it. You know, we have a great Spanish chef, Sergio Arola, and, and for a long time, French food was the only food in, in, in that part of the world. Today, you go to Spain, you're not going to ask for French food. You're going to ask for the Spanish chefs what they're creating. But that takes a long, 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 long time, even for a very dominant, strong force like Spain to to get get on the map, right? It's, it's been a lot of work through those chefs and the government getting behind it and sending foods of Spain uh, to the Europe and, can and the continent here. And when you don't have that total support effort yet, it's what is it? I think a lot of people are all open to try African food, but most people say, well, what is it? I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So I think it takes a long time to educate the masses about it. And what Peter is doing with the wine industry and what we're trying to do with this uh, book, it's part of that, you know, and then you have to go there, which is a good part. Yeah. You, you, um, the spices that you've been using today, is there, is there like a one-stop shop in New York where you can get those to make the combination? There is, there's tons of places where you can get it, but I would always recommend actually to go to your local, I mean, in, Ethio in, um, in um, go to your local restaurant. Here, like there's about eight Ethiopian restaurants, they all would happily sell you the butter and the berbere, and you know, I think that's the best way you can get the indigenous you can also have, on, on 28th and Lex, you have all the great Indian spice stores, which is very similar. So, yes. Hi, my name is, is it on? Okay, my name is Carrie, I'm from San Francisco, and I'm uh, executive chef for Adele Sausage Company. Um, I'm interested in your take on the difference between North Africa and mm -hmm. Sub-Saharan Africa, yeah. because I think there's a, quite a distinct difference in mm -hmm. the cuisine. And um, you know, many of us are very familiar with North African, especially yeah. Moroccan mm -hmm. and in e Egyptian type cuisine, yeah. which we all call Mediterranean. Yeah. And it falls into that realm. But if you could comment, and also yeah. about the wine differences that you might suggest. Well, in terms of the food, if you look at if you start in Africa, it's, it's very much linked to staple food. If you start in Morocco, you go down to Mali, Senegal, and it's couscous. Then once Ghana, Nigeria comes around, it becomes kenke, which is fermented corn, uh, almost like a porridge. Then you have in Nigeria and Cameroon, it becomes fufu, which is sort of like the staple there. The fufu is, for lack of better words, it's like a root mashed potato that's eaten with every meal. Then you go down to, the, to South Africa, since it's such a mixed country, you have pap, which is the Wahili people eat. Pap is what we would call polenta. And um, then you obviously, obviously have a lot of rice and noodles from the Asian influences. And once you go up the coast, 
the pop culture change. It's, it's still pop, but since the people, uh, the, the language where he still stays, so you have in Uganda and Tanzania, Kenya, you have something called ugali. It's the same dish as the polenta or the pop, but it just changes its name. You come to Ethiopia, and the highland forces to, this is why the teff, it only grows in Ethiopia, so the injera becomes a staple. Then you go around to Egypt, uh, where the staple becomes rice. And so it really, it changes that way. Another major thing is also religion. So like, um, um, the, the food is based on fasting periods. Like, Ethiopia has 200 fasting days. So that forces sort of the, so it's, I think it's colonization, climate, and, and the religion to really force our people eat. Uh, um, yeah, so that would be the biggest difference. So the wines that, that you know, starting out in all those regions, traditionally, beer is still king in Africa, believe it or not, and part of it is the heat and, and also uh, customary custom. But some areas, obviously, religious affects the uh, uh, introduction of alcohol into the household, and it's not allowed per se. But if you look at the, the as uh, Chef was saying, the staples, and then look, lamb is a big, in, in the northern African, mm -hmm. lamb is huge as, as such. So again, uh, for the people that choose to, from that area, nice elegant Shiraz or, or you know, nice Bordeaux style blend, light dough, is, is what works well because the grapes usually reach full ripeness and so you have nice sugar content but not over uh, heavy alcohol. As you go further south, that Mediterranean effect, you have more mangoes and tropical fruits in the wine, and the white wines especially. Then you have a flinty character underlying because of the minerals. You know, all your diamonds and gold, most of it comes from uh, South Africa. It still has three quarters of the world's gold supply underground. So the mineral content in the soil is so intricate. Magnesium, various limestone. So there you have that underpinning of this great mineral structure that will hold up to spices. And, and the, 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 uh, it won't outrun the food or the food won't outrun the wine. So that's the kind of balance uh, you look for. And then you have ports from that area of the world. And uh, you know some of the ports, they're not cloying sweet. They complement dishes very well. And then you cook with them and marinate with them. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You, Marcus. Thank you.